thank you very much for your presence. And uh, we uh, are very pleased with uh, organizing this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, because the European Union, that was the starting point of uh, our reflection, is uh, quite uh, a self-confident, if not to say arrogant, uh, with regard to the defense of human rights uh, and civil liberties uh, worldwide. And we see ourselves always as better than the aggressive Americans and better than the author authoritarian uh, Chinese. Uh, and indeed, it's true, countries uh, who want to join the European Union um, have to meet the high standards uh, of democratic governance and of human rights. And uh, as everybody of you knows, uh, these are established by the so-called Copenhagen criteria. The doors of uh, our union uh, remain uh, closed uh, uh, for, and for good reasons to countries that do not respect freedom of the press, uh, do not respect uh, equal rights uh, to the LGBTI uh, community or uh, independence of the judiciary. Uh, and uh, the prospect of an EU membership is always a strong incentive for countries to make every effort uh, to qualify uh, as a model uh, democracy. But once you are in, then things are changing completely. Uh, we are not so strict when it comes to countries that are already member uh, of the uh, European Union. Uh, once you are in, uh, no more checks uh, and no more scrutiny. Uh, the European Union has uh, uh, only, uh, that's our assessment, uh, a few weak instruments for making sure its uh, members remain committed to democratic governance, the rule of law and fundamental rights. Uh, and yeah, on top of that, the member states, most member states, have little appetite for binding rules in all of these uh, uh, fields. So, uh, reality is that in recent years, uh, our union uh, was unable, and from time to time also unwilling, uh, to discipline uh, members uh, uh, of uh, our club uh, who do not uh, respect uh, the rules. And again and again, fundamental rights uh, have been and continue uh, to be violated uh, in the Union. Uh, deportation of Roma people, anti-gay laws, intimidation of the media, uh, also uh, uh, undermining the independency of the uh, judiciary, uh, clandestine mass surveillance programs, uh, complicity even in torture programs, uh, manipulation and abuse of electoral laws to eliminate uh, opposition parties, uh, also impunity in a number of countries for corruption, uh, and so on. Now, member states have all signed uh, the uh, uh, EU treaties, uh, but uh, in practice, uh, they are very reluctant to, to apply uh, these standards they have signed up to. And in the ab absence of uh, binding rules, the rule of law, uh, and fundamental rights, uh, member states do not feel bound in any way uh, by uh, the standards they have imposed and they still impose uh, to uh, candidate uh, uh, countries. Uh, it, the, the reason why we have organized then this seminar is because we think that the EU cannot be credible and cannot have moral authority worldwide uh, if it is unable to uphold its own uh, standards. Uh, democratic governance, the rule of law, fundamental rights are, are not secondary uh, to uh, the single market rules or, for example, the rules of uh, budget uh, discipline. If anything, they are maybe even more important uh, than these uh, rules. And it is, uh, in my opinion, no uh, coincidence that the values of the European Union are mentioned in, in Article 2 of the treaty before all the other aims of the European uh, Union. So in the treaties, European values are given the highest importance. Uh, and now uh, let's make sure, and that is the, 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 uh, the exercise that we want to do with you today, uh, to make sure th that we find the ways and the tools also to make sure that they get the highest importance in practice and not only 
uh, in uh, the treaties. So we think that the European Union urgently needs uh, effective instruments uh, to ensure uh, all members uh, to uh, abide by the rules. Uh, like it is the case with the Stability and Growth Pact for the Eurozone, uh, we think, uh, and that is what we uh, want to discuss with you, that the European Union needs a democratic governance uh, pact. Um, I come back a little bit to the Stability Pact, the financial crisis and the impact on the European economy and budgets led the European Union to take action to reinforce uh, its budgetary and economic uh, coherence, uh, adopting new instruments so that member states better respect their obligations and commitments. Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, political momentum is needed for the, for the same level of compliance uh, and a common approach to be taken when it comes to the rule of law and when it comes to the fundamental rights in uh, the Union. And uh, that is the reason why we organized the seminar to put forward to you uh, and to all the stakeholders uh, yeah, a, a concrete proposal to do that. The European Union needs to provide itself with the tools uh, needed for compliance and enforcement, and, and, and we think that we can bundle all these tools in what we call a democratic governance pact, uh, laying down rules for the monitoring uh, and enforcement of the rule of law, of the fundamental rights by the different member states of uh, the Union. But how it works, I'm not going to explain this myself. Uh, that's. Uh, Sophie uh, in felt who is going to do that, and I'm very pleased uh, to give her the floor immediately. Yes, thank you, Guy. Um, at the, the, the start of the first panel, after Jean-Marie Cavada has spoken, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, explain to everybody what the, uh, the scoreboard instrument is all about, but first just some uh, introductory remarks. Um, Guy has just highlighted the fact that um, Unlike in the Eurozone, where the European Union has now doted itself with instruments, with binding rules, with enforceable rules, uh, when it comes to what we cherish most, our values, laid down in Article 2, we have no enforceable rules. Uh, it's all on a voluntary basis. Uh, and the instruments that we have are, are either very weak, we have a couple of laws, for example, anti-discrimination uh, laws, um, or we have the nuclear instrument of Article 7, which may lead to a suspension of a member state. But there's nothing in between. Uh, and more and more I get the feeling, looking at the situation in the member states, that they're, they're exploiting that void. Um, one example that was brought to my attention uh, yesterday was, for example, um, a law that will be proposed in Spain. And if I understand correctly, the idea is uh, that people can be detained indefinitely without further need for uh, uh, um, uh, the intervention of a, of a court. Um, now, this is only a draft law, and we were considering uh, asking questions to the European Commission. The point is, if you ask a question of this kind to the European Commission, I can already predict the answer. It will be, ah, no, this is only a draft law. Uh, there's nothing we can say because it's still in the drafting stage. Mm -hmm. Once the law has been adopted, the European Commission is going to say, oh, sorry, it's not our competence because the Charter of Fundamental Rights only applies to the transposition of EU law. So there's nothing we can do. Now, this, I think, example, and there are plenty, plenty, plenty for all member states, uh, illustrates very well um, you know, that the European Union urgently needs instruments to make sure that uh, values, that fundamental rights, that the rule of law become a reality for everybody and not just something on paper uh, in Article 2 of the, the treaties. Um, we've uh, already a couple of weeks ago um, presented, uh, presented our, uh, the, the paper on the Democratic Governance Pact with our, uh, with our proposals, which will be further elaborated here today. And that was just a couple of days uh, after the tragic events in, in Paris. Uh, and we hesitated for a few days thinking, is this the right moment to present our initiative? And then we decided to go ahead with it anyway. And we said, yes, this is the right moment because we want to defend our citizens against violence. 
but we also want to defend our democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights against erosion from the inside. Because again, we always talk a lot about democracy, fundamental rights and uh, the rule of law uh, as our most cherished values, our shared values. But if you see how we, how we treat them in reality, how carelessly, um, I sometimes get um, extremely worried. So we presented our, our paper to the European Commission, to Commissioner Timmermans, who uh, has the portfolio of fundamental rights and the rule of law. Uh, and he said, uh, yes, thank you very much. That's very interesting. But the Commission um, will only make use of the instrument of silent diplomacy because we feel that's more effective. Now, I was surprised because, first of all, diplomacy, in my view, is something for external relations. And, you know, to my knowledge, all EU member states are internal uh, affairs. And secondly, um, of course, we need a dialogue. And I'm going to say more about that when I, uh, when I introduce the instrument. Um, it's not only about, uh, uh, let's say, sanctions. At the same time, if you do not have the, the possibility of sanctions, then member states are simply not going to respect the rules. Uh, you know, we're all human beings. If there are no laws telling us what we can or cannot do. Um, we, uh, we're, we're not always behaving like saints and neither are member states. So that is why uh, we're very pleased to have this second seminar here today where we're going to, uh, to introduce uh, the concrete instruments. I'm going to say a little more about that uh, later on. Um, but first, I would like to invite Jean-Marie Cavada uh, on behalf of the jury committee to, um, to make his statement. Merci, Sophie. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you, Guy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming along today. In parallel to the economic crisis which has uh, afflicted the European Union, there's a democratic crisis as well, which is making itself felt over the last few years. And so at the moment we are faced with a political test and an ethical test indeed, because it affects the fundamental values which pervaded our democracies in Europe and which were cast aside by wars. So we have to meet this challenge and we need to show realism and I think firmness at the same time. It's more useful than ever to recall that the protection of fundamental rights is the first pillar of the Union, even though uh, you don't necessarily call it that, but you're right to say chairman just now that the article 2 says that so all the articles are to do with trade and the economy and everything else all the other articles but they are all designed to achieve that first goal which is the sound balance of fundamental rights in all countries of the union so I think we need to take stock of how we're doing on that score and that's why the Copenhagen criteria indeed were drawn up this is a sine qua non for new members being allowed to exceed. First of all, they have to respect rights. And these criteria are seeking to consolidate the democratic model throughout the continent. And this is a model based on respect for human rights, freedoms, which our citizens should enjoy, and independence of the judiciary from the politicians, basically. So it's a, an attractive idea for a lot of countries to join the Union for many reasons. It's a good way to ensure one's economic development. But the European Union, fortunately, isn't just about economics. So I think we need to look at this question with greater energy than we have in the last 20 years. The democratic model, which is being promulgated by the European Union, has been shaken and we even have representatives in our institutions now. It's not a, a Frenchman who sent quite a lot of uh, people into the institutions who are opposed to this. It's, it's not me who can give lessons, but I can raise the alarm on this as a number of under other countries have done. This democratic model has been shaken in several countries. Ten years ago there was the Berlusconi and the Italian press issue, for example. Seven years ago, uh, or since the first seven years now, Hungary has gone through all sorts of turbulence because their government have been trampling uh, 
on the main principles attacking freedom of the press. Uh, they said they felt they needed to decommunize their institutions, but that's not uh, a reason to just organize them. Um, they showed a great uh, disdain for economic treaties. They taxed non-Hungarian EU companies, uh, flagrant breach of the treaty. Uh, they carried out a domestic domesticity of justice in other words uh, look looking to control the justice system and through the politicians and then lately they've been running searches of NGOs two months ago there was a seminar on freedom in the country while we were actually speaking the Hungarian police were raiding NGOs and searching their offices, claiming that those NGOs had accepted Norwegian money, as if Norway was threatening to invade the rest of Europe. All of this is nonsensical, of course, and it comes from Hungary, a country which has gone through two dictatorships and has seen the rise of some wonderful heroes over history. So, And then you remember the Union at the time was uh, remarkable. There was a kind of uh, atomic bomb, which was actually a Scud missile, which led to the fall of the Haider government in Austria. And then they lost the elections and Austria came back to uh, the norm of democratic values. So Austria has been through it as well. And now these very states who were committed to good democratic governance and who hid d during the time behind a rather fluffy interpretation of subsidiarity saying that uh, member states shouldn't have to brook any EU interference. These now have emerged as lies by the state which you now have to explain yourself to the European Union about, so you can't get away with that anymore. I would say that probably one of the issues we have to explore is to ex establish in our principles a link between upholding fundamental rights and the application of economic benefits which come with membership of the Union. To spell this out, a uh, system for preparing economically the states for accession, but that has to go hand in hand at the same speed with a system of organization of civil society and upholding rights. It's not very complicated, really. It would apply to justice, the justice system, the press, freedom to organize, freedom of association, assembly, trade unions, and so on. So I think we need to establish a link, a direct link between upholding rights and the economic benefits which the EU is offering, because the EU is asking that those countries to make economic headway, so why not also ask them to make headway on fundamental rights as well? I don't want to go through an exhaustive list of breaches of fundamental rights. I've listed some here, there are many others, but I'd like to say that a, not a lot of member states need to make progress in the Union itself already. To have a solid democracy, it is vital to ask yourself the right questions now. Would we accept today the accession of Hungary, say, the Orban government, into a European Union? Well, maybe we would, in which case our measures are inadequate. It's a kind of sieve with lots of holes in it, and the tick that he got for his uh, government was based on his economic achievements. Maintaining fundamental rights in Europe involves greater vigilance with regard to uh, upholding the democratic commitments entered into by members before they've even signed and before they actually join. In the run-up to joining, we cannot have any half measures on this and we should come down heavily on countries that do not maintain our democratic model. So I agree on the idea of having kind of intermediary stage, an alert between doing nothing and Article 7. 
half way house. And in the worst cases, I think we should resort to Article 7 because that has been shown to be effective. I hope that the seminar will allow us to demonstrate more responsibility, which is our duty in the Union, because in fundamental rights, as in other issues, sometimes I have the impression that the only enemy of the EU is its very member states. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Um, I, I suggest that uh, we immediately move to the, the, the first session, the first panel, uh, and I will kick that off by introducing the, uh, the scoreboard. Maybe we can have it on screen. Looking at the ladies. Yes, there we go. Okay, you probably also all have a, have a paper copy and you're going to be a bit puzzled and think, uh, what is this? Are we going to play bingo here this afternoon? No. <laughs> this is actually, this is the scoreboard where we have scored 28 member states of the European Union with uh, red, green, and yellow balls. It's like a traffic light. Uh, and it's the same method as in the European semester for the, for the Eurozone. This is the way member states have accepted to have their national budgets and their, uh, their national reform plans judged every year in exactly the same manner. Well, not you know, in, in, an, in a neat little table, but we at ALDA are always, uh, you know, we're more tech savvy than the council, but they use the same color code. They use green for good or on track, yellow for at risk, and red when it's not good and not on track. Now, we did this exercise over the last two weeks uh, and we actually know which countries are behind these colors. But we discussed for a little while because we realized that for many people, everybody supported the idea. Everybody said, oh, wow, this is great. Um, but I don't want my country to be in there. So we decided for this very first time to anonymize the, the scores. But this was also the last time, because I'm going to make a proposal. And the proposal is that we're going to, uh, as we have said, that we want to use the same method as the European semester for the Eurozone. We want to make this a European semester for democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental rights. So I would like to invite you to all come back this fall, and Alde is going to organize another seminar, and I hope very much that by then it will be a cross-party seminar, and we're going to have another table like this, but it will not be anonymized anymore. So that means that member states have until this fall to make sure that everything is green here, so we allow them some time. But I'm going to invite everybody who is present here and everybody who is watching on webstream and everybody else who's, who's interested to help complete the second version of this table. Because we've now made use of um, publicly available information and I think you also have the lists uh, in front of you, organizations like Reporters Without Borders, uh, Index for the, the Voice of Free Expression, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, Open Society Institute, the uh, Gender Equality Institute, European Women's Lobby, ILGA Europe, Transgender, and many, many more. Um, and I think it would be interesting if all those organizations that are reporting regularly on the situation in countries, country by country reporting, that we all adopt the same method and that by the fall of 2015, we can jointly produce a table like this and as I said, preferably, it will be all green for all countries. Um, and that we can do this as an annual exercise and that it will be a joint exercise. We will have a joint debate. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very pleased that the parties, all the main parties will be represented here this afternoon. I hope it will continue to be a cross party event and that the European Parliament uh, can lead the way here. And the last thing that I want to say about this instrument is as I said before, people embraced the idea, everybody was applauding, uh, until they saw their country appear on this table. Now, this is not anything official. You know, it was just a bit, uh, 
sort of almost tongue in cheek to visualize uh, the situation in countries. It's not scientifically, uh, um, uh, uh, we didn't use a scientific method or anything, but the mere fact that people get nervous by something like this, which, which is a, a playful attempt uh, at doing something for the rule of law and fundamental rights, shows that the instrument works. Now, if we're going to make this a joint exercise, and if finally the European Commission and the Council will also be on board, then we will have a real big, strong instrument for the enforcement of democratic rules, the rule of law, and fundamental rights. So I'm going to invite everybody to, uh, to join in this initiative. So that is what I have to say about our, about our scoreboard. So, uh, well, you can still use it for bingo at home. Um, and I'm now going to, uh, to introduce our speakers, and I'm extremely pleased um, that we have two excellent panels here uh, today. Uh, the first panel made up of uh, experts, and I'm first going to extend a special welcome to Natasha Kazachkin uh, of Amnesty International, known to most of you because you're sick, but you decided to come here anyway. Fundamental rights are more important than the flu. Uh, I hope that... Uh, Ambassador Freund, who's sitting next to you, is not going to catch anything <laughs> because we also need you. The Ambassador is head of the Brussels office of the Council of Europe to the European Union. And then to my right, Mr. Gabriel Toggenburg, who is the senior legal advisor of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights uh, in Vienna. And I'm actually going to ask you in the inverse order of the presentation to uh, to make your intervention uh, of about 10 minutes. Mr. Toggenborg, you have the floor. Thank you, Mrs. Infeld. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think this is uh, a totally exciting event. And I, of course, uh, <clears throat> already glanced through the, the paper, uh, which, which is indeed uh, exciting. As a boring lawyer, I'm, of course, interested in, in the sentence that says at the very end of it, when it says legal basis, the proposals and instruments called by ALDE fit within the remit of the current treaties and would not necessarily necessitate any changes to the treaties. That is interesting, and I guess it, it's not an easy task to really check whether this then corresponds to reality. Uh, maybe it's no coincidence that the single measures are not allocated already now to specific treaty articles. This will be then uh, the process which really um, creates certain tensions. I think we have to realize that the initiative can be easily misunderstood as a supranational power grab, and therefore I think it is very important that from the beginning one has to signal that actually this is fruit of multi-level pragmatism in the sense that actually the ambition should be that all the layers of governance come together in order to um, make our shared values a reality and everyone would use its um, competences. In, in general, I think that this invitation and this debate we are having here shows that the, the, the rule of law debate has tremendously moved forward, and it has moved forward to the better. And I would give you three proofs, three elements of proofs why this is the case. Firstly, the debate has moved from a uh, Article 7 emergency context to a shared concern how we can promote our shared values. Secondly, the debate moved from a rather reactive approach of containment towards the ambition to show how actually the European Union can proactively promote fundamental rights in whatever the Union is doing. And thirdly, the debate moved from a rather narrow understanding of what the rule of law means to something which is much wider, encompasses all the Article 2 values, and reflects much better the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which in our reading, the agency reading, is actually a list of more detailed um, obligations based on Article 2. So I think the Charter stands at the core of all this. But let me already come to the, the topic of, of the, this meeting here, and this is, of course, indicators and, and, and the use of scoreboards in the context of fundamental rights. And I totally share that this is important. I, I think there is this saying that goes as follows, what gets measured gets done. And I think there is some truth in that. If you are able to measure performance, then you actually can do two things. You can identify shortcomings, and you can also explain how you can address these shortcomings. And I think fundamental rights indicators can deliver on, on those two. Of course, it's not easy. Um, there are many pitfalls in, in the uh, establishment of fundamental rights uh, indicators. And maybe I would again give you 
three examples from our experiences because, because we have been testing fundamental rights indicators over the last years. And uh, I would give you, like to give you three um, examples of what we at least learned. Firstly, we think that indicators are most convincing if they cover all the three dimensions uh, ranging from formal commitment, so that's is there legislation or not, is there an institution or not, to secondly, the concrete efforts taken, so are there policies in place, would the member state provide financial stimuli, are there um, access to justice procedure provided, etc. To finally, the last dimension, which is the results in the life of the people on the street. So do all these measures and instruments actually have an effect on the lives of real people? So this is uh, an approach that normally is referred to as SPO approach, structure, process, outcome, and I think this is important. Secondly, indicators have to be relevant, they have to be reliable, comparable and objective, and this is already a lot, I guess, but, but it makes it even worse. They also have to be perceived as being all this. And how do you come to that situation? One way of doing that is that you actually create co-ownership of those that you actually then want to benchmark against these indicators so that you maybe get the member states on board in designing the indicators. Um, we, did, we did that, for instance, in the context of Roma integration policies, where we established a, a working group with 17 EU member states, where over years we um, designed together a complex system of indicators in various areas of life, so housing, employment, uh, education, etc. And a, a core group of these member states were then ready to test these indicators. They asked their national statistical offers to populate these indicators with national data. And the European Commission is going to use these indicators in their uh, reporting on the uh, national integration strategies. And I can tell you this was not easy, uh, but it also showed it's possible. If you really invest energy, if you are serious about it, then it is possible. And my last example of our experience is that indicators can be populated with existing data. So there is no need to create new uh, data collection exercises, mechanisms, institutions. We did a, a test run, a small pilot, where we looked at three member states. We did that again together with them. Uh, and we looked at all the monitoring material that is available at the international level as well as at European level, so Council of Europe and European Union. You might be aware that every year around 50 monitoring reports are delivered on EU member states, so there's a lot of material. And we, just as, as Mrs. Infeld explained, we also had this color code, red, green, uh, yellow, and we wanted to see whether on the basis of the existing data, we are able to populate indicators we defined together with these three member states. We zoomed in three policy areas, so one was uh, access to justice in discrimination cases, the other one was hate crime, and the third one was the independence of non-judicial bodies. And we could see that for the structure component, so for the question, are there legislation in place, or are there institutions there, you find information, you can really assess member states. The second dimension, so what sort of policies are there? Are there financial stimuli? Is the budget fundamental rights compliant, etc.? It's already a bit more difficult. The, the data situation is a bit worse, but still it's possible to really classify and cluster member states. When it comes then to the outcome dimension, there you really have a major issue with, with the data situation because hardly you find uh, survey data, and that has to do with the fact that the classical monitoring procedure uh, wouldn't look for this data. It's also far too expensive, of course. And therefore, maybe there is a, re a, a reason for sort of shifting emphasis from the, the state, the duty bearer, to the rights holder, the, 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 the woman, the man on the street. So use surveys. Survey is something where, where maybe there is need for some additional investment. Coming already to the, to the end, I think we are now in a situation where we see there are many different dots, right? We have um, the new commission's instrument for uh, strengthening the rule of law. We have the justice scoreboard. We have the corruption report. Um, now we have even an annual dialogue in the council on the rule of law. Um, we have this new idea maybe to use the European semester also for fundamental rights purposes, which I think would be extremely interesting because so far the rule of law puts a focus on civil and political rights. And if we use the European semester, that would also complement in the sense that you would push into the debate the social economic rights. 
So all this is there. What is missing is the linkage between all these dots. And of course, the, the big elephant in the room is the question, who is doing what? The, the power question in the end, right? How does the parliament relate to the commission? What is the role of the council? What sort of input would um, be served to whom, etc.? All these questions are, of course, interinstitutional political questions, and that the FRA has uh, no interest and no role to have any views in this regard. But we have an interest in the outcome, and therefore, to end with three points, I would like to explain what the FRA could offer in, in all this. Again, three points. Firstly, I think we could, as an independent expert body, help the political actors to come up with methodologies that are scientifically sound. Uh, I think that is totally crucial, especially from the member states' perspective. You have to send a signal that this is really sound and reliable. Uh, of course, that could be also done with the help of our scientific committee. As you might know, we have uh, 11 people on this independent board, uh, and every name of these 11 persons is, is um, actually worldwide known in the area of human rights. Secondly, what we can do is that we can feed in the process by providing data. We can do that by using our network of networks. We have expert network, networks in all the 28 member states, and they can actually, in quite a short time frame, provide a constitutional comparison of a legal situation. So that uh, takes um, uh, eight weeks, and we can sort of provide the, the whole picture in the 28 member states, which um, is, is quite rarely the case with other networks. Also, of course, we can uh, launch these large-scale uh, surveys, uh, for instance, the Viol Violence Against Women survey, I guess you are aware of. And thirdly, lastly, uh, we could also maybe assist in the design of this mechanism to make sure that this is also showing a bit of a bottom-up approach. Uh, we have networks towards civil society, towards the national human rights bodies, equality bodies, NHIS, etc. And I think it would be important to make sure that this new discussion, this mechanism, is transparent and uh, is also co-designed by civil society. And I think there you could also use our, our networks, for instance, the fundamental rights platform, where you have around 400 civil society institutions. And, and with that, uh, I think I would like to conclude and thank you again for the invitation. Well, thank you very much um, for, for that uh, extremely interesting and, and useful introduction. And you've already given me new ideas on how to improve this, because this is indeed anything but scientific. Um, but it's, it's, I think we want a, a political tool. This is about, this is not about having uh, you know, this is not going to be a legal instrument ever, but it, it has to be uh, about peer pressure and, and people not wanting to, to be um, the, 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 the worst pupil uh, in the class. So this will have to help us getting everything uh, green. And I think one last re remark before I pass on to Ambassador uh, Freuns is that one of the things that Commissioner Timmermans said was, oh, you know, this is not going to work because, well, you know, values, fundamental rights, rule of law, it's all not quantifiable. Uh, it, you cannot define it. You can't, uh, you, you cannot measure it. Uh, and I was a bit mystified by that because, well, first of all, I think that we are showing here that you, you can measure and quantify. This is all based on, on uh, information that is available. Um, but we're doing exactly that with the candidate countries. And we also have a similar mechanism for Bulgaria and Romania. And you also mentioned some examples. So I really don't see, I mean, you know, if you just say values aren't quantifiable, they cannot be measured, therefore we don't need to do anything. I think that's a, a, a terrible argument. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass the floor to Mr. Tormbjörn Frunz, uh, Frunjes, Frunz, sorry, Frunjes, sorry. Uh, and I would also like to, uh, um, on his behalf, I think, uh, promote the report that um, is, it's been laid out in the room, State of Democracy, Human Rights and the Rule of Law uh, in Europe, report by the Secretary General of the Council of, of, of Europe, which I think is a fantastic initiative. And I think the, there's only one page missing, and it's this one. <laughs> but maybe that will be a step um, for the future. Uh, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much uh, indeed, and thank you for inviting me to this um, very interesting presentation. Um, I think it's very good of you to invite the Council of Europe uh, to such a session, because in fact, over the last years, uh, the European Union and the Council of Europe um, have worked together 
very decisively to uh, create an even stronger protection system for human rights, the rule of law, and democracy in Europe. And uh, I must say that as all EU member countries also are members of the Council of Europe, our organization would support every effort of the EU institutions aimed at strengthening the EU capacity to contribute to the protection of those uh, fundamental principles. Uh, as was uh, brilliantly illustrated by the honorable members of the European Parliament, Per Hofstadt de Kavada, we are living through uh, challenging times in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, therefore, it is all the more important that uh, the European institutions carry a joint responsibility to stand together and strengthen the existing protection system in Europe and to ensure coherence. On this, with this departure, um, may I then offer some comments uh, on, on your proposal. First of all, I think that new initiatives should always take into account what we have so that we avoid the risk of weakening existing standards and mechanisms that serve the same or similar purpose areas. Uh, I think uh, at the same time that such existing standards and mechanisms can be helpful in adding value to new initiatives, I would therefore suggest that initiatives to set up new mechanisms to respect democracy and fundamental rights in EU member countries should take into account relevant existing mechanisms within the Council of Europe. Over the years, the Council of Europe has laid down important European legal standards through more than 200 legally binding conventions uh, covering grosso modo all the areas or the variables that you have enumerated in your scoreboard. And uh, to each and every one of those, there are monitoring mechanisms set up to help implement these standards. These independent and non-political mechanisms supervise the implementation of the obligations, discern cases of non-compliance, and propose solutions or address recommendations to each of its member states. Evidently, the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights are certainly the most well known. But the court system is complemented by independent monitoring institutions, such as, for example, the uh, Commissioner for U uh, Human Rights, and by independent mechanisms like the Committee of Social Rights, um, monitoring uh, the social rights in each and every uh, country, including all the EU countries, uh, comparing it to the uh, uh, economic consequences of austerity, for example. Uh, we have uh, the CPT, the Anti-Torture Committee, that has in its mandate the possibility of um, intervening in any detentionary facility, in any um, institution at 24 hours notice. Very important for upholding integrity in our societies. We have the Venice Commission, uh, which is offering advice on constitutional um, issues and issues related to democracy. Uh, the president of the Venice Commission, Gianni Bukikiu, is presently in Kyiv. He met yesterday with uh, President Poroshenko and suggested that a member of the Venice Commission could sit on the new constitutional commission that will be established by the end of the week. We have the CEPEJ, which has a huge monitoring system of the efficiency of justice, of the judiciary in our countries. We have the Greco institution, very important to monitor corruption. Uh, we have Greta uh, concerning the fight against human trafficking, etc. So, EU member countries are already benefiting from the work of monitoring the rule of law and human rights violations by the Council of Europe and its instruments. The fact that other European countries are subjected to the same standards, in my opinion, solidifies the legitimacy of those standards and strengthens the acceptance of the work of its monitoring bodies. In order to strengthen the existing system, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Council of Europe countries two years ago decided that the Secretary General should present on a regular basis an overview of, 
for the state of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in Europe, based on the findings of these monitoring mechanisms that I have mentioned. And I thank you very much for uh, uh, advertising this uh, excellent publication, which is, in fact, the first yearbook of the state of affairs when it comes to democracy, the rule of law, and human rights in the whole of Europe, including the 19 member countries of the Council of Europe outside the EU member countries. Um, when Secretary General Jagland presented this to the foreign minister last year, he uh, pointed, he, he clustered three main challenges uh, which were based on the findings of the country of monitoring mechanism. And it's interesting to see what they are. Firstly, there is a cluster of weaknesses in member countries of checks and balances in terms of independent judiciary and independent media with grave consequences in several member countries. Secondly, uh, the second main trend is that the economic crisis is harming social rights and also human rights in several countries. The third main trend is that there is a growing discrimination against minorities, in particular Muslims, Jews, Roma people, all over the continent and also against migrants. Uh, faced with the serious challenges that we see in Europe of today, there is a strong need now to recall the very basic principle that democracy, human rights, and the rule of law are important for securing stability uh, and security in Europe. This was, in fact, the reason why, in 1949, the country of Europe was established. So, as a consequence, uh, the Secretary General's second annual report uh, of this kind will particularly focus on the capacity of governments to provide security for their citizens through compliance with democratic norms. This report will uh, be made public in the first half of April 2015 in advance of the next foreign minister's meeting of the Council of Europe, which will uh, take place here in Brussels on the 19th of May. So this would be an interesting process also for your further process uh, developing the scoreboard initiative. So I hope this material will be uh, useful for you. And uh, I would suggest that we would welcome any uh, greater involvement from the EU side in uh, the implementation of recommendations from the monitoring bodies within the member countries. And if the scoreboard can help in this way, it's most welcome as well. Can I lastly make one concrete suggestion? I suggest that uh, you could promote greater involvement of the EU in the Council of Europe monitoring bodies and uh, uh, strengthen, in order to strengthen the European protection system of fundamental rights and the rule of law. I recall in this regard a very interesting resolution which was passed by the European Parliament in 2010, where the European Parliament, with an overwhelming majority, called for EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights but considered this as only an essential first step, which should be complemented, uh, completed by EU accession to, for example, the Social Charter, or Council of Europe bodies such as the CPT, the ECRI, which is the uh, Commission Against uh, Racial Discrimination, CEPEJ, and for strengthening cooperation between institutions of the EU and specialized bodies. There are considerations, very active considerations underway, and there is a long process on a possible membership of the EU in Greco, for example, to strengthen the fight uh, against corruption in, in Europe. There are also considerations underway concerning the possibility that the EU could accede to the Council of Europe uh, Convention Against Domestic Violence, the so-called Istanbul Convention, and indeed, uh, the Lanzarote Convention against sexual exploitation of, of children. So this would be also, I think, part of an interesting follow-up agenda to the uh, initiative that you have taken and which hopefully will be included 
in the debate that this that I'm sure that this initiative will uh, will will create. Uh, so my message is that if we look at what we have, when we are looking for where to go, coherence of standards and synergies in action can be achieved. And instead of risking to weaken, weaken existing mechanisms, we can strengthen them and make new ones more effective as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, I uh, completely agree with that. We should not uh, duplicate instruments, uh, but we should make uh, we should build on the existing ones and make them more effective, and also make sure that member states fully apply them and that they're applied equally throughout the European Union. Okay, final speaker in this round, Natasha Kazachkin from Amnesty International. Yes, uh, hello. So I'm Natasha Kazachkin from Amnesty International. Um, I think uh, a lot was said uh, already, uh, and I will not uh, repeat everything. I think we heard today, and this is very interesting, I agree uh, with Gabriel that uh, we have concrete ideas now that are being discussed in various fora about how the EU can, in jargon, operationalize its commitment to be, to be an essential uh, a union founded on human rights. And this, you know, we've been calling for this debate for a long time, and it is taking place. I also uh, want to uh, agree with what was said by the ambassador and recall the essential role of the Council of Europe as the reference for human rights standards uh, in Europe. Not only should we not duplicate, but the fact that vital role played by the Council of Europe has, should never be a substitute for EU stronger action. We want stronger EU action on human rights, and we want the Council of Europe to remain the Council of Europe with all its monitoring. It's not a question of one against the other. And the EU should definitely, in all the mechanisms and processes it's thinking about now, look at how it can um, translate EU recommendations into concrete results for human rights, for protection of human rights in Europe. Uh, on behalf of Amnesty, so I'm here today on behalf of Amnesty, but I want to say I'm also um, the coordinator of a new uh, group of NGOs, part of the Human Rights Democracy Network, uh, who's trying to uh, also advocate for stronger EU action on human rights. And I'm speaking also on their behalf today. I hope that the uh, remarks uh, I will make can, can complement and support what was said and also what will be said in the next panel, which I think uh, um, also um, they are very much linked to what, we, what will be said in the next panel, and that it can inspire EU institutions because, as Gabriel says, we do need political action and we do need changes in the institutional settings. And on this one very concrete call is that uh, the, the ideas put forward today uh, feature in the next EP report on human rights in the EU that will be upcoming. But most importantly, that this report is discussed substantively in the Council and the Commission. This has not happened before. We have already a lot of proposals on the table and they are not being substantively discussed or put on the agendas of the Council meetings or of the Commission meetings. This should be the case. And this would be a, a, a something that the, uh, the Parliament should pursue in addition to giving ideas. Now, um, to take a step back at the big picture, I think, uh, of, of how EU is um, uh, uh, acting to uh, uphold and promote human rights. Uh, as, as it has been said, it's, I think nobody now, um, you know, can dispute the fact that we need, uh, the EU needs to demonstrate, really it needs to demonstrate its willingness to give practical a meaning to Article 2 of the treaties, which says it is founded uh, on human rights, uh, democracy, equality. And I think the need to do so should not be the matter of debate, and we have to move on from that. But indeed, it should be our starting point, because I want to remind everyone that in Article 3 of the treaties that is, comes just after, it's very it says explicitly that the Union's aim is to promote its values. It's an objective of the Union. It should be clear political objective. I also want, and I'm sorry if it was already said before I came, to remind uh, everyone of Article 7, which is also in the treaties and which gives powers to the EU. So it is there. 
not to act not only in the event of a breach of common values in the limited field of EU law, but also in the event of a breach in an area where the member states act uh, autonomously. So the power is there, uh, the positive, positive obligation is there to promote human rights. How uh, is the union fulfilling uh, this obligation? For uh, us NGOs working on human rights in the EU every day, what we see at present as the most problematic is that there is no plan, actually. There is no plan, there is no vision, there is no strategy of the EU of how to achieve the same of promoting, upholding human rights. We have work programs in various fields of internal EU competence with some human rights related uh, priorities, but what we're still missing is a comprehensive human rights approach, what we have called an internal strategy to guide meaningful concerted action of all EU institutions on human rights. And I would just also um, uh, alert you to the fact that it's interesting that by contrast in the field of external relations, the EU has on the, has had this reflection and has come up with a strategic framework and action plan on human rights. It is not doing that in the internal field. We hear, we have the charter, we have international law, but no, in practice what we see is that this is not enough to really uh, lead to consistent and meaningful action by the EU. So just a few questions and uh, directions that uh, in our view, uh, uh, a comprehensive strategy should tackle. First, how are EU legislative and other policy proposals not only checked against the Charter, as we've been uh, uh, told this would be improved in all areas, but how are they also you know, prioritized, complemented, balanced with other proposals that will ensure the necessary human rights standards and safeguards are built in the system I mean, the EU can make policies that maybe don't go against human rights, but how about the other complementing policies it needs to promote them? When the European arrest warrant was adopted in 2002, there was a promise that there will be procedural safeguards for suspects and accused. It, it had, we had to wait for eight years to get a roadmap and 2010 to get a directive. Today we have new discussions on counterterrorism measures or PNR. Let's think also about other measures that need to be uh, taken in the EU to ensure protection of human rights. The EU has a responsibility to strengthen its policy and legislative framework on human rights, to remedy the gaps in protection. And there's loads of monitoring of data from the FRA, from the Council of Europe, from uh, human rights organizations that it should take into account to decide on its priorities and where it's going to act. This is one important point. Then how is existing uh, EU law and policies, how are they not just transposed or applied formally by member states, but how, do they, how, they, how are they implemented in a way that upholds human rights? A strategy must look, uh, and this, this links to things that were said before, at improving the EU's monitoring of human rights in the implementation of its policies and laws. And here also, it must uh, absolutely, seriously, it has overlooked this in all its strategies so far on the Charter. It must look at how systematically it takes into account the other monitoring uh, bodies' findings and, re and discuss in transparency and in a meaningful dialogue with people on the ground who are documenting abuse to understand, to apprehend what is the problem and what is needed and what can, be, uh, and, and what can the EU do. This is very important. One very concrete uh, point. Uh, the Commission now has an annual report on implementation of the Charter. If you look at it, what it is, right now is a formal activity report of EU action, and this is very much too often what we see. These reports have to become accountability tools. They have to combine not only activity reports from the Commission, but what was said by other actors working on human rights, experts on human rights, and make some conclusions out of this. Be a bit analytical and think forward. This is what we want in a strategy. And then finally, uh, the very important question that uh, is on, on the table now for, for, for the last two years, 
how can the EU uh, promote its values if it's not prepared to take the political, the moral, the legal, in some cases, responsibility when these values are at risk or are actually being undermined in member states. This is not sustainable for the EU, and the Parliament has raised this point on uh, and on. We think the EU institutions need, at the very least, to be able to speak in one voice all together to express concerns when such situations are happening, and they have to make clear to EU citizens, but also to the outside world, that they are actively engaging in finding a solution until the solution is found, and they will be held accountable for this. It cannot be just ad hoc actions on the way. They are part of the solution uh, to uh, remedy the human rights uh, violations. In the area of, of, of EU law, Amnesty International and others have been really pushing for more effective use of some of the instruments available, namely the infringement procedures which can sanction uh, states who violate EU law. And they can be used to make sure that states do not violate human rights. How many infringements do we see every year in the area of competition law or otherwise? We still have much too little when it comes to enforcing human rights obligations of member states. I've heard Mr. Timmermans say we will use other tools, including infringement, to tackle human rights. The, much, much more thinking must be done in a strategy. How, it's, it's good to say it, but how would it work in practice? The, there is a strategy on infringement. It has to be looked at. How can it become a sort of litigation strategy for human rights? You know, how can we use better the pilots before? Concretely, how do we make sure that human rights are prioritized in the case of infringement? And then lastly, outside EU law, when we're in this gray zone, when we're not, I think we are in EU law, we are in Article 2, we are in Article 7, where we don't have a directive that's directly violated. And this has been the case with Hungary, and it was said again in a Libe hearing uh, 10 days ago, very strongly, the, the, the level the, of undermining of human rights uh, that has been going on. Well, in March last year, the Commission put forward a framework to strengthen the rule of law. The Commission, uh, the Council, sorry, in December, now committed to having a regular dialogue on rule of law in member states. Okay, this was supposed to fill the gap, they said, between the infringement and between Article 7. But what have we seen? Nothing has changed. This hasn't been triggered. And I just want to put to you the situation with, with Hungary. The Commission did take some action, it's true. It is monitoring, we know, but the action is limited and on some issues it has declared itself incompetent. So, and the Council has remained silent. So the Hungarian government can very safely say We've done what the Commission asked. There's no issue of EU law. The EP has made recommendations, but they're biased and not objective. This is political. And the Council, the Member States have no lessons to give to us. And actually, they haven't. This is what the, the, the Hungarian government can say. This needs to change. The EU has to be able to put pressure on its Member States and to stand up together to say that some situations um, do not uh, comply with its values. Uh, one way, very uh, right now, would be to use its framework, the framework that it, uh, it has uh, uh, put forward uh, last year, activate it, test it on Hungary, test it on the issue of accountability for torture and enforced disappearance in the CIA renditions that was documented uh, in many resolutions from, from the EP. Test it and we'll evaluate if really we are out of this deadlock of the nuclear option of Article 7. And finally, don't forget that Article 7, if the threshold for activating it, for starting the sanctions, for determining that there is a clear breach is very high, there's also a preventive aspect of Article 7, and this should not be overlooked. There is a lot also here of ideas that have put forward by the European Parliament in particular on how it can be uh, better used. One, uh, one of them was the formal notice, which is uh, also um, in, the, in, in the pact. Uh, there was also some um, freezing uh, mechanisms that have been uh, proposed when we identify a risk. 
uh, and then formalize partnerships with the Fundamental Rights Agency, with the Council of Europe, again, to assess uh, risk situations. So, um, this is some uh, points we wanted to, to, to say today. We need a reaffirmation by all EU institutions of their commitment uh, to promote EU values. The elaboration of a strategy, an in-depth strategy, is needed. It's not an easy task. Uh, and it implies work and ideas on many fronts, but we can't start from the nitty gritty. There has to be this overall um, uh, strategic framework. It needs a rethinking of some institutional arrangements and uh, enhancing the capacity of EU institutions on human rights. At the council level, uh, with NGOs, we've been uh, working hard on the Council, trying in particular to uh, empower one of its working groups called FREMP uh, to become a strong human rights actor and that can properly, properly lead, coordinate the Council's uh, action on human rights. Uh, with regard to the Commission, I think we have a new first vice president in charge of rule of law and fundamental rights. Um, he must lead the overall debate. He must speak out uh, on human rights violations and ensure coordination and delivery in all areas uh, of internal policies. Finally, uh, <clears throat> and this is also why uh, I thought important, and I thank you for inviting us, uh, much more transparency and dialogue uh, with civil societies and external actors is needed on human rights so we can have an objective uh, debate and discuss, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategies in a way that's not politicized and jeopardized by national interests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciated by everybody, I hear. Okay, then uh, I'm going to, without further ado, open the floor for debate. Uh, everybody present uh, can participate in the debate. I already see a few requests on the floor, but I'm going to prioritize a little bit uh, the MEPs, but not exclusively. But can everybody who takes the floor uh, state their name and or their organization where relevant so that we all know who is speaking? Um, I think first request for, I first take Mrs. Uh, Bilbao. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, one and all, and thank you very much for these presentations. I think they were very interesting. Fundamentally, we all agree. We all agree on the essentials. First of all, I'd like to turn to the ambassador. I've taken a quick look at his report. I need something else on your chart. The dog, with the dogs, the, 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 the countries uh, that uh, have been in breach of fundamental principles, but we don't know who they are. And that would be really interesting. Who's in breach on what? We've got the summaries, but we don't know who we're talking about. Secondly, We are organizing this seminar because uh, with terrorism, everyone's asking, what do we do? And that brings me to my question. If we don't have a strategy or the like, how do we bring pressure to bear on member states? And I'll begin with something that uh, Sophie said. In uh, the Spanish state, thanks to an agreement of the two major political parties, the Partido Popular, which is in uh, power, and the Socialist Party, uh, an agreement has been reached to change the criminal code. The, the possibility of uh, permanent prison sentences, in other words, that you can review uh, uh, life sentences and keep people in prison forever. And of course, it's very difficult to know how the review of the sentence would take place. This is an ambiguous notion and could lead to serious breaches of human rights. And there's a new definition of crime, or rather terrorism, seriously endangering the functioning of the state's institutions. When Mr. Asnar was uh, Prime Minister, he used precisely this idea to alter the criminal code and to take our president to court. 
because in the European Parliament the we in the Basque Country started changing our uh, constitution for the Basque Country and altering the competences we have but of course we were taken to task for this but there's more to this passenger name records the Spanish state has already taken initial steps to create that so my question is what can we do to stop it one final point if I may regrettably in the past country we have suffered terrorist violence from ETA very much indeed and we know what it is we know what it is uh, for democratic principles to be sidelined in the name of the fight against terrorism that's how the uh, members of the Bureau, the best parliament, are uh, not able to fully enjoy their political rights, but we don't really know exactly why. Because members of the uh, best parliament Bureau have had to go to the Human Rights Court to seek protection. The same happened with the uh, closure of a newspaper, Edungaria. Uh, for alleged terrorist events, offences, they were shut down. But uh, 10 years down the line, everyone was acquitted. And uh, I would remind you of the many rulings of the Court of Human Rights for uh, the wrong implementation of uh, prison sentences and the like. So in talking about Hungary, let's not just look at Hungary, because we've suffered on the Basque country, but but nonetheless, we've, we have always been transparent in the Basque country. We don't want the same kind of thing happening because of a different type of terrorism. In the fight against terrorism, you can't use any means available. The end does not justify the means. How about coordination between police forces in Europe? But uh, the trouble is the central governments uh, uh, don't want to do that and quite often police officers think well this is my information so my question is given certain measures being adopted by countries such as spain what can we do thank you uh next speaker is mr pinto is there anybody else who wants to come in in this round you, you, the, uh, De Deborah, uh, Sophia. Just, just one second anybody else signal now no then uh, we have to you can say yes. I'm afraid I have to uh, step out quite quickly because I've got to go to the airport. So could I uh, speak now, if at all possible? Can I do that? All right, thank you. So my thanks to the panelists. Uh, the presentations we heard were of a very high caliber and a especially warm welcome to the representative of Amnesty International. Uh, I'm, I've been a member of Amnesty International in Portugal for over 15 years. It's the only organization to which I belong, in fact. And uh, I want to bear witness to the hugely important role played by Amnesty International in Portugal, not just in the times of the fascist dictatorship, but also in times of democracy. I wholeheartedly endorse my colleagues words here on the left the fight against terrorism the fight uh, the fight against crime is used as a pretext for curtailing rights and for infringements of fundamental principles of rule of law what's happening in spain is terrible but uh, it's happening elsewhere in europe and not just in hungary portugal has been taken to court at the, to the human rights uh, court and to be and found guilty of breaches of the freedom of expression because because this fundamental freedom is not fully respected in Portugal freedom of expression is simply not respected now many many fundamental rights are forgotten about ignored human rights fundamental rights are just um, ornaments for the preambles to legislation 
or fancy words in political speeches. I was a member of the Portuguese bar for many years and I saw v very serious human right breaches in certain fields and quite often they go unnoticed. People don't seem to worry about it, certainly not in the media. In families in Portugal there are breaches of human rights. That's through family violence, violence against women, violence against the elderly, violence against children. There are breaches of human rights also in Portuguese prisons and Amnesty International has played a huge role in denouncing that. Prisons in Portugal are areas without law. Basically, the word of the prison officers is the law there. The constitution and the legislation of the country simply do not apply. So prisons. And then there's the question of immigrants. Portugal has a high level of immigrants from Africa and former Portuguese colonies. These minorities uh, don't have their rights respected in the countries they come from. So the, the European Union has to send out clear signals, for instance, from Portugal, but from all governments, to ensure that it's effective measures are taken to protect human rights. Human rights are, are, are to be protected, particularly for people whom we wouldn't want to sit down at the table. The criminals, terrorists, they too have rights. That's the final barrier, that, and their rights deserve protection as well, and that's very important in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last speaker, um, Deborah. Yes, hello. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Deborah Newton Cook. Um, from what I've heard, we, we seem to be going round in circles chasing our tails about um, how to keep track of human rights. It's, as you say, sir, the elephant in the room. And I was looking at um, Sophie's unofficial scoreboard and there are two member states who come out with green lights. And I was just wondering what your opinion is on the possibility of getting one member state, or possibly two, to pick up the button in running terminology and run with this issue. Because who is going to take this on? We seem to need to have one or two or possibly more member states, and I certainly wouldn't expect the United Kingdom to be in the forefront of this argument. Um, to, to, to run with this, somebody has to lead from the front. So I would just like your reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, before asking the panel to reply, um, I, I have a question of my own because um, we actually have a very extensive and sophisticated toolkit for the protection of democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights. And yet, uh, to, to use the term um, that Natasha used, it's not operationalized. There's a lot of talk about fundamental rights but it's not really put into practice. If I hear governments propose that the encryption of our communications will become a, a criminal offense, but in full respect of our privacy, I really wonder you know, what they're talking about. Um, so there is this whole issue of language and it's even uh, the opposite where the language from the rule of law is being used to legalize human rights violations. And I'm thinking notably of the cases of torture by the CIA, which were completely, um, there were you know, these bureaucratic legal notes, which turned it into something, to a legal issue almost. But it was torture in reality. So they're actually using the tools of the rule of law in order to commit human rights violations. So how are we going to get from the toolkit, which we have on paper, to reality. I'm going to take the 
speakers in the same order, and I use the opportunity to already welcome Mr. Dolan, but we'll come back to you in the, in the next panel. Mr. Togenborg. I guess that uh, a question you understand it. It's quite difficult to really find a solution to it, but I, I totally agree that we are in need of a framework. And, and I was referring to an elephant in the room because I think that that, that is really a very political decision. Who is in the lead? Who is uh, contributing to this? And, and uh, <clears throat> there are now certain elements that I think are quite promising. So for instance, uh, the idea to have a dialogue regularly in the council of course you can say this is uh, soft law and, and who knows how serious this discussion is, but still it is quite historic to say that once a year the Council is addressing fundamental rights issues and, and addressing the rule of law. Um, to my understanding it's a bit unclear whether this discussion will be entirely political or whether there will be also the possibility to base it at least on a certain evidence base, and of course, I, I would hope that this is the case. I mean, th these discussions should be based on, for instance, the annual report of the Fundamental Rights Agency, which, by the way, is going to have a different phase uh, in its upcom upcoming version because it will be much more political, much more opinionated than it used to be in, in the past. And I think also the European Commission has its ideas now on how to create a sort of a policy cycle on how to link the dots um, how to make sure that uh, the, the, the thinking uh, really takes fundamental rights concerns into account. And I think that will be the first step. Um, more, I think, is for me very difficult to say. I, I also simply hope that the, the political class uh, in, in Brussels and Strasbourg uh, sort of feels the, the urgency. And I think there are now so many good ideas on the table that what you need now is actually political will. Um, which degree that is existent, I don't know. But I think, uh, since you were referring to the, the leadership, I think there is a solid group of member states that have indeed a strong interest. H to which degree they come out, uh, that I don't know. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, let me just first uh, reply to the question posed by the Honorable Member of Parliament, Bilbao. Uh, concerning the, um, her observation that uh, the um, summary uh, of the report does not uh, qualify country-by-country uh, country results, um, which is correct, uh, but uh, it's based on country-by-country uh, country reports from the monitoring uh, bodies, uh, and for example, um, the court in uh, Strasbourg has very uh, substantial statistical material uh, which is giving very detailed um, information about uh, the situation in each and every uh, individual country. Uh, I would suggest that um, in order to vitalize the debate about human rights, I think um, what my neighbor uh, to the left from, uh, from Amnesty International suggested is you know, very important. It has to, uh, we have to sort of uh, think in the direction of substantiating uh, meetings in, in the institutions. There is nothing that would prevent the council, for example, from using the very rich evidence that you will find in country reports from every uh, single monitoring body that would be of relevance to the question of the state of affairs concerning human rights, democracy and the rule of law and create debates on this. There is nothing that prevents uh, this house to have hearings on the basis of the documented evidence that you will find from country to country. But you will see that in reality, uh, it's not so easy to get a proper consensus on doing this. But the evidence is there, uh, so it's the question of willingness to use the mechanisms and institutions that we have and have a substantiated debate. And, you know, in the um, Committee of Ministers meetings in Strasbourg, that oversee the execution of court judgments. 
there is a remarkable lack of engagement from member countries, EU or non-EU member countries, other than uh, the country that responds to the uh, uh, agenda item of, uh, the, of a particular case uh, allotted to this nationality. I've been chairing the Committee of Ministers, so I have seen this over time. It's obvious that political parties, by using more initiative and force, could vitalize such fora. So I think uh, a good place would be to start there, because that is the, it's, it's hard, but it's, it's obviously there, and it's a lacuna for the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Natasha, last one. Yeah, I, I think this point is, is very important. And uh, we, we do, uh, I think that the tracking of human rights, as was referred to, it does, it does exist. But what we are missing is the substantive discussions at EU level and confronting the challenges. It may, we may not have the solutions straight away, huh? and we don't have to expect the EU to have the solution. And I don't think anybody expects straight away, but discuss it, confront it, and name it as a human rights issue. And this goes back to the question of language. I think what we're, when NGOs were calling also for this strategic framework, it's not just words, strategy, roadmaps. It should be, like in the external affairs, built on the human rights framework. This has to be re-said re by the EU that this is their framework. Disconnected right now for a moment from EU law that exists or EU action it can take. But really what is human rights? What are we talking about? What kind of challenges do we face? Then we see where do we have enough? Where can we do more? Where do we need new mechanism? But don't start the discussion with uh, EU law limitations straight away. And then with regard to counterterrorism, I think this is very interesting because there will be proposals maybe from the EU, but maybe not so much. There'll be a lot coming from member states too, and there are a lot of the debates right now. The, the EU has to be present also in these debates, monitor what is going on, and be ready to actually, as we said, monitor how they will comply with human rights and with EU law, if there will be actions that will need to be taken, and does the EU itself need to enhance again its own standards to make sure that there are no violations of human rights committed. With regard to prisons, I just want to flag that there's been a lot of calls for EU action, stronger action in the field of detention. And something also to think about is, what do we do when authoritative calls from NGOs, Council of Europe, UN bodies, ask the EU to act, not to mention its own parliament, and it doesn't. There should be some accountability again. The EU institutions should be able to explain for objective reasons why they're not doing it and how or when they're going to do it if they're not doing it now. This would be also very important for the democratic debate. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists. Oh, no, I, I had a last request for the floor, very, very briefly. Mrs. Bilbao. Sí. No, gracias por Thank you for your replies. I'll turn to the ambassador, if I may. It's really difficult to engage in debate when, in this report, we don't have names, the names of the member states, and there must be a reason for that. Yes, there is information available, but it's the ministries responsible uh, for the violations that are on the forums and which provide information. So. That leaves us in serious difficulties. My political party is in government in my autonomous region, and yet we're happy to engage in debate. So my question is, this information on the cases of breaches of human rights within the European Union, is that is that transparent information? Is it reliable? Is it accessible? Can we all have access to it? If so, then I will say to you that this political group is committed to human rights. Uh, Sophie Bayouglia said, we undertake to organize a conference where we will name names or member states and cases of human rights, see what we can do, do about them, and try to elicit a political commitment from member states and from political parties to move ahead with a strategic program. But the thing is, we need to know whether the information is transparent 
because at the end of the day, the member states are both guilty, but they're also judging themselves. Includes the first panel. Um, a big thank you to uh, to all the panelists for your uh, your your time and your very <laughs> valuable input. Um, so thank you again. I hope that you will stay here for the rest of the debate, despite the flu. Um, and then uh, I'm going to invite uh, up to the podium already uh, our colleague from the S&D group, Mr. Niedermüller, uh, who's been here. I hear that um, Mr. Engel of the uh, EPP is uh, uh, running down the corridors of this building in order to be here, uh, and that um, Mrs. Ferrara, who is from the EFDD group and also rapporteur on the annual fundamental rights report, is also on her way, but uh, held up in, uh, in another urgent meeting on a similar topic. Um, so I'm going to start, we're just going to, uh, to, to, uh, to start the panel and um, then the others can, can join in. Uh, so first I'm going to uh, welcome Mr. Dolan, uh, Director of the Transparency International EU Office, very welcome. Colleague Niedermüller, very welcome to you too. Um, and I'm, I'm going to repeat the message when the other colleagues arrive. Uh, I'm very pleased that we are, we're having, ah, here's Mrs. Ferrara. Very welcome. <laughs> Please take your seat on the podium. Um, yes, and then we'll also have um, Mr. Uh, Engel from the EPP group uh, joining us uh, in a bit. Uh, and I'm actually very pleased that the, the other groups have taken up our invitation to, uh, to uh, engage in this debate because I think it's, it's not a partisan issue, it is uh, about our shared values and we may, uh, we may argue about some of the details. Hello. Good Welcome. evening. I'm sorry for <laughs> my late. I'm very sorry. Um, but it's it's very important that we. Uh, there is Mr. Engel right on cue. Please take your seat on the podium. <laughs> I was just saying welcome again, um, and I'm saying that I'm I'm pleased that we have a, a cross-party panel here. Um, this is the last panel uh, of today. Thank you for coming. And uh, just to give you a, a very brief introduction, uh, we've been talking about how, you know, about mechanisms to uphold uh, the de democratic governance, rule of law, and fundamental rights in Europe. And we have also, uh, we've introduced our democratic governance pact, and as part of that, the, uh, the scoreboard. And we did one which is uh, anonymous for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> but we said that we, we hope that this is going to be a, a joint event and that sometime in fall, we can have another cross-party panel, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll prepare a scoreboard uh, which is going to include the names of the countries. But of course, by then, they will be green because they still have time until fall to better their ways. Um, so, but they are, they are warned now, and I hope that everybody's going to be, uh, to be on board. And just for the information of the new panelists, we initially wanted to include the names of the countries here, uh, but whereas everybody thought it was a fantastic idea, they didn't want their own country to be included, which for me How is come? which for me is proof that it works. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, very welcome. Uh, I'm going to first ask Mrs. Ferrara to uh, to give us a very brief presentation. Let's say about uh, seven minutes uh, maximum on your report of the state of fundamental rights in the European Union. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry I'm going to speak in, Itali in Italian <coughs> because it's better for me and for you also. <laughs> so, bene, come ha già detto la mia collega, sono. As my colleague was saying, I'm rapporteur for the annual report on fundamental rights for 2013 to 2014. The report was designed was structured in two parts. One part more focused on the institutional aspect, rule of law, all the institutional aspects, the way politics is organized, the European institutions. And then the second part is more concentrated on breaches of human rights. Uh, so the new commission has come in now. There's a fundamental rights agency with a new head. There's an ad hoc commissioner, Timmermans, for human rights. So 
this very much leads us to hope that there'll be more attention devoted to human rights and their protection. The work towards the final draft of the report will involve all sorts of representatives from the various institutions and representatives of civil society. A questionnaire has been sent out to various NGOs so that we can get feedback from them as to the worst violations or the most urgent violations to point out of fundamental rights. The objective is of course to check scrupulously uh, how the rule of law has been observed and any breaches of human rights, not just for members who have just joined or are about to join, but also with regard to those that are in and have been in a long time, because monitoring of protection of human rights is something that should be ongoing. It should happen all the time. It's a work in progress. This report, by the way, for the European Parliament is a first. It's their first opportunity to express their view on the new mechanisms proposed by the Commission last March on the rule of law. The Commission proposed a more bland mechanism, Article 7, which aims to launch a dialogue with the member state concerned before the situation degenerates and therefore it seeks to establish whether there are any cases of systematic violations so that after that one can issue a public recommendation and check up on the state. We feel that this mechanism isn't really ambitious enough and won't constitute a proper safeguard because if you're talking about systematic violations then they would already have happened, and quite frequently at that. So one needs to act at an earlier stage, really, to ensure that there is greater protection and more effective protection. The strategy which we are suggesting, which is along the lines of the last resolution on fundamental rights, and the rapporteur for that was Louis Michel from our group, from, from your group, Alde. He was looking at Article 2 of the treaty, and this would involve all European Union bodies active in the area of fundamental rights. Now, various European institutions do issue a report on an annual basis on fundamental rights. The Commission does that, the Fundamental Rights Agency does it, the Council does it, through its conclusions on the Commission's report, and the Parliament issues a report through the Civil Liberties and Justice Committee. And there's a Legal Affairs Committee report on fundamental rights in the rest of the world. So what does all this boil down to? Well, it's a bit of a hodgepodge, and there's no process between the two, th all these reports, which leads to a result which would take into account all the rec recommendations issued in each separate report or resolution. So the danger is that a lot of the warnings in these reports are not dealt with and don't lead to anything happening in practice. So the idea is to have an institutionalized political cycle based on Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, drawing together all these annual reports issued by the various institutions. And then, as Timmermans was suggesting, we would end up with a, an open forum, which we hope would involve the participation of national organisations as well who work in human rights. The implementation of, the implementation of this strategy would allow us to improve the well-being of citizens and to enhance the credibility of the institutions. The strategy should lead to a number of measures which will protect and uphold fundamental rights. These measures can be 
uh, facilitated through an exchange of best practice in member states or as has been suggested in previous reports there can be an extension of this justice scoreboard so that measures not just be taken with regard to civil and administrative justice but also involve the criminal justice system and could be a good yardstick for assessing any possible violations of human rights. There could also be a stronger mandate for the Fundamental Rights Agency. A database, for example, could be set up, bringing together all the data on violations which occur in member states so that we can keep track of what's happening where and how and how we can stop things happening so that there's a better protection of people. The second part of the report seeks to identify the violations which have happened in practice so that we can stop discrimination, so that we can protect migrants, protect individuals whose rights have been violated, and we can look at the impact of austerity measures on the fundamental rights of citizens throughout the European Union. We could also look at organized crime and corruption. This is because very often the phenomena of organized crime and corruption do tend to be seen as just uh, affecting the economic sphere, whereas we know that in fact, it is much worse than that. These are phenomena which, above all indeed, primarily affect the fundamental rights of citizens, their freedom, their independence, freedom of expression. So we're going to devote particular attention to these subjects. Finally, one last proposal which could be made could be setting up a, a monitoring system based on peer-to-peer -peer monitoring with independent experts involved uh, using the database of the FRA and there could be on-site visits in member states so that we could assess the situation in each member state and then adopt regular reports so that there's an ongoing monitoring of member states by member states and this would happen in every member state, so everyone would be regularly monitored. And then, if uh, there, aren't, there isn't enough action to protect human rights, we could think of having recourse to Article 7 of the TEU, which is... Uh, a mechanism if the peer monitoring fails we could resort to article 7 which would involve sanctions levied against a member state that has violated human rights and that could work as a deterrent we hope for any future violations thank you Grazie lei. thank you very much uh, then i'm immediately going to uh, because i keep one eye on the clock and i'm going to ask all the all the panelists to stay within the uh, the, the time um, my colleague from the S&D group, Mr. Niedermüller, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I will try uh, really to be very short and very briefly. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for inviting me to speak in this panel. And I think so one of the reasons we are having uh, this discussion is the country I know best. And this is, the, this is Hungary, and you have mentioned many times uh, these uh, this, this, uh, examples. <laughs> I will be very brief. Uh, but that alone would be enough uh, for me to be here, but there is another, re another, another reason. The example of this country, the example of Hungary, showed how hypocritical the European Union may become if we don't find a solution for the protection of our fundamental values. Um, and I would like to put some very simple questions at the beginning. <clears throat> How could the European Union go around the world lecturing third countries about these basic principles and not having the means, uh, the political will, 
to deal with its own member states who question, mock these values, and try to play from a different rule book. And the second uh, uh, question. Um, in recent years, uh, we witnessed the strengthening of far-right extremist parties whose political ideas are aiming uh, at dismantling these values. And there are also those parties who are on the surface, looks like sharing our values, sharing our European values, but then in government, they tend to interpret them very flexibly and bend them <coughs> to favor their current political needs. Um, if we let anyone get away with such a behavior, what is to stop others from following in their footsteps? Um, and I think so we have seen in the last years <coughs> when it comes to guaranteeing the compliance with the constitutional values enshrined in the treaties, the European Union faces complications, huge complications. The values are so common to the member state definitions might differ from country to country. Um, if we take the concept of the rule of law as an example, we find three different prevailing approaches in Europe. The rule of law of the United Kingdom, uh, the Rechtsstaat of Germany, uh, and the French Etat de droit. S they are the same ideas, but very divergent contents and the EU is bound to respect the national identities and national histories inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional. Therefore, I think that the burdensome task is to find that line between respecting national identities and safeguarding our core values, at the same time to be able to prevent member states from jeopardizing the attainment of the Union's objectives. But I think so, uh, there are some more practical and also theoretical difficulties, and I am going to mention only some practical issues. First of all, it is the interpretation of Article 2. It is also very hard to challenge those in breach of the fundamental values unless the content of these values is defined and commonly agreed. I think so, the Article 2 is formulated on a very general level. It's talking about human dignity, dignity uh, about democracy and solidarity and so on. And I think so, it's very important to talk about much more concrete, much more concrete forms. And therefore, we have to put the question, how can we state that the government violates fundamental law and rights? Who can state it and in which form? What is the institutional way of, of, of it? And let me take a concrete example. Um, in this other initiative outlines enumerates different indicators like freedom of speech, freedom of press, media pluralism, separation of powers, access to justice, and so on. And we all know that the current Hungarian government on all these fields violates fundamental laws and rights systematically, and nobody is able or too ready to state uh, that the Hungarian government violates articles two of the treaty. And of course, you can say that this is what we are going um, to do, Amnesty International and, and other NGOs, but this is not the same as, as, as a political body. This is not the commission. <coughs> and I think so, I have to remember uh, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the public hearing of the, vice, of the first vice president, Mr. Timmermans, uh, who told in his uh, hearing that I will use all the tools, I can, but he has no tools. This is the problem, that there is no way what to do. And, and I think so, uh, we have the same problem with the monitoring process. We, we have to put the question, who can monitor the situation of fundamental law in, in the member state? What consequences could have uh, such a monitoring? And then I think so, this is a very sad statement, let me say on that way, uh, that nothing will happen because there is no political will. And this is the central and the crucial issue for me, that there is no political will to do that. Um, Therefore, I think so that one of the most important suggestions of your paper is that setting up an expert group for defining 
these values and rights based on the case law of the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, and on the experience of the Council of Europe is an essential step, I think so. And maybe in that process, and I think so it's an important issue, maybe in that process we can also learn how illiberal democracy uh, would look like, and this is something that the Hungarian Prime Minister likes so very much. So. Uh, <clears throat> um, in, in, in the end, just let, let, let me say that I think so it's, it's also a very important suggestion, this European semester for a democratic governance, rule of law and human rights. And uh, of course, it's, I, it, it's very, very important that we can move the, the council and we can move the commission uh, to that step that he's really dealing with these issues. Somebody told in the discussion that we have so many agreements and so, so many process about economic uh, issues and about social issues, and no one about, you, you, you told it in, in your presentation, and almost no uh, process in the, on the field of the human rights, fundamental rights, and fundamental law. And I think so, if we will, uh, 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 we, we, we won't be ready to tackle this issue and just to talk very openly about the violations of human rights on different fields of social and cultural life. And if we are not talking about it, what happens to a member state uh, uh, with his illiberal democracy in the European Union, then we will destroy the European Union very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last uh, speaker from the political groups, EPP group, Mr. Engel. And now, really, you want, you want me to talk about Hungary? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but, I, but, I will, but I will most unfortunately not be able to totally, to totally eschew uh, the subject. Um, I remember when we did this, uh, when we did this uh, Libya Committee report on Hungary, it was not that long ago, and there was one or two major mistakes that we committed, I believe, and that are constantly committed when we're addressing fundamental issues. But then again, around the report, and especially in my group, there was one thing that was committed which is even worse, and that's the second topic that I want to address. The first is in the report, I remember that three quarters of the, of the subjects that we tried to address are in fact irrelevant. We lost ourselves in detail instead of focusing on the major traits of a society that is going astray. Well, not the society maybe, but the political system that tries to govern the society. I remember, for instance, that we, that we did a big stunt on, uh, on the number of churches having been, having been lowered. Uh, when it all started, apparently there were 350 churches in Hungary. Now, with the best possible will on earth, I can't think of 350 churches. There's no way I'm thinking of 350 churches. And there are no 350 churches. So the mere fact that you try and lower the number of something that is supposed to be halfway institutionally perceptible is not in itself bad, and we should even have avoided it. But because we didn't, we gave ample opportunity to the Hungarian authorities to react to that and to many other things by simply saying, you're against everything, this is not, this is not reasonable. At the same time, something happened which, in my view, is the fundamental problem when addressing these issues. No matter what we're talking about, we don't exactly know what we're talking about. We're constantly referring ourselves to our values. I don't know what our values are. And it's not so clear what these values are, methinks. And if you asked 15 colleagues in this house, or if each and every one of us were now asked to name three, it would be very well possible that those three would not be identical. Um, and nowhere have we written them down. Which is why, Peter, Article 2 is not necessarily very helpful because that is, that is a, as a vague formulation that had to be chosen because some formulation had to be chosen, but we are not, we're not so very clear about what is possible and what is not. Nowhere in the treaty does it say European democracy must not be illiberal. Now, all of us here, I suppose, do not really conceive of a democracy that is not liberal democracy. I said this in plenary uh, recently. I, I, I cannot conceive of, of a form of democratic expression, democratic organization, which would not have liberal traits. 
in the classical sense of what liberal means, not in the party uh, political uh, sense of here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to join your group. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but of course, I suppose we, we, would, we would all agree on this. But at the same time, there is no treaty article which would say, to democracy thou shalt be liberal. And if the Hungarian prime minister elucubrates on his, uh, on his uh, models of success around the globe, and his uh, probably also very much governance-related uh, <laughs> reference items that, 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 he, that he can find, there is, there is nothing in the treaty and nothing in secondary legislation that would say you are not allowed to do that. And our problem is that too often for the wrong reasons, and I'm talking as a member of the European People's Party, party of uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister is a member of our club, not one that I would have wanted, by the way, but I was not alone to decide. And um, of course we have uh, the tendency that every family has, one protects one's own, and one says it cannot be so bad. And because it cannot be so bad, we let it run. We've let a system run which, in fact, is antithetical to virtually everything that I believe European treaties are about and European integration should mean. I do not fundamentally, for instance, believe that the European treaties are about trying to reincorporate every single ethnic Hungarian into Hungarian statehood. Yet this is exactly what the current Hungarian government is attempting to do. I find this wrong. I would approach the problem by saying we abolish the borders. And after that, every single Hungarian can meet every other single Hungarian without any problems, and this is going to be just fine. And for most of them, it would be. Yet something else is taking place, and there is absolutely no rule in a European treaty or indeed in any secondary legislation item which would say, thou shalt not give out passports to people that live in a different country. There is also no item that says thou shalt not present a list for the European elections on which there is a citizen from the Vojvodina, from uh, the Ukraine, and another from, uh, from, 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 where else was the third place? Yet they do present such sort of lists, and there is pretty little we can, we can do about that as long as either we don't have a treaty article which prevents a certain, a certain evolution from happening, or rhetoric is stronger than acts and uh, people are still halfway free to move around uh, a given country as they wish and uh, whichever German chancellor comes to visit, uh, they're given a more or less warm welcome, a few words of thanks and after that the German chancellor goes home again and says, ah, it's not so bad. <laughs> now, this was about Hungary. Most unfortunately, I always get carried away, as we all, as we all d do when it's about Hungary, but this is, not all, this is not only about Hungary. This is about so many other things. This is, about, uh, this is about corrupt political classes as well, which have, which have made millions and millions of Europeans lose the last remaining element <laughs> of trust in the political system. And when you don't go to vote any longer, or when you've just lost every, every sort of trust you could have in a political system, then there is a certain inclination to vote for people that are about the exact contrary of what we are here now talking about. So there is, there is, there is a lot that is, um, that is wrong, I believe, on this, uh, uh, on this continent. I am certainly not against verification mechanisms, on the contrary. I'm certainly not opposed to having ways and means of assessing whether or not a given situation still vaguely corresponds to what we believe is acceptable in terms of governance uh, structures uh, and, and, and uh, if not to give, us, to give us means of action. But I believe that all of this, as long as, we're not, as, we're, as long as we're not clear about what we really are about, is not really going to help. As long as we will continue to accept that someone is just different. And because that someone is different, that someone also acts differently. Um, we're not, going to go to, we're not going to go very far. Uh, this being different has, 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 has various notions. It 
it, it, it entails accepting that in the south of Europe they're definitely different from the north of Europe and then the, that in the east they're different from the west. And apparently it also entails that they govern in a different way. Now, I believe it will be time that we finally settle down and say these are the, the items on which differences are conceivable and these are the items on which differences are no longer conceivable. Because if we want to be a political family in the best sense of the word, we also must accept that from certain political rules of governance, you shall no longer divert yourself. And, um, and this is something that we're, not, uh, that, we're not, that we're not yet ready to do. There is still a thing called national sovereignty. And this national sovereignty in this very specific sense could very well be an element that, uh, that is going to be troublesome for, uh, for quite some times to come. There is, there is now a Hungarian issue. There's a Bulgarian issue as well. There's even a Romanian issue. There might be tomorrow a Dutch or a, or a Luxembourgish or an Italian issue. Uh, there may be many issues. I'm, af I'm afraid we're going to be confronted by issue after issue in the years to come, just because we've never really managed to agree on not only where we are in the world, but on how we want to be in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I have to say, uh, to your credit, you've always been incredibly outspoken, where you say that uh, some are too quiet. And Mrs. Merkel was very outspoken uh, last week when she, uh, she visited uh, Hungary. And I, uh, I much appreciate that. And I also think that your, your, uh, it's been said in different ways today that we need to um, uh, that we haven't yet fully defined what our shared values are, but I think we have embarked on the process of defining those shared values. And I know one thing for sure, and that's why I'm so pleased that there are four different political groups on this podium. Even if we don't know exactly, down to the last comma, what our shared values are, there are some people elected to this new European Parliament that definitely not sh do not share our shared values. And there, that's why I think it's extremely important that, that we work together uh, across party lines. Okay, I'm going to invite uh, the last speaker and I, I would like, already like to mentally prepare uh, the audience that um, assuming that Mr. Dolan will also stay within the time like the other speakers, that we'll have just a few minutes left. We really have to finish at five. Um, so I'm going to allow probably only one burning question. So, you know, you, you think you think <laughs> about that question uh, and then we'll really conclude uh, at five. Mr. Dolan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sophie. It's uh, always an unenviable position to be the uh, last speaker on a seminar such as this, particularly when the speakers before me have been of such a high caliber. And the challenge, of course, is always to say something that hasn't been said before. But I. I hope I can rise to the challenge and maybe bring a little bit of uh, a fresh perspective because we've had a lot of discussion and talk about uh, indicators and strategies and reports. Uh, and of course, Transparency International has a lot of experience of this kind of work. We're probably best known for our Corruption Perceptions Index, which of course is an indicator, which is a very useful and reliable indicator of corruption, but maybe of limited use in the, for the kind of topics that we're talking about today. We also have a lot of experience uh, with uh, EU reports. We have uh, a lot of experience of the European Commission's anti-corruption report, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and maybe we could talk about that later, about uh, how useful that has been in addressing some of the problems in the member states. Uh, and indeed, it is a report that is also used in the European semester exercise. So I think it could be, could be a useful template for some of the ideas that you're talking about. But all of this information is, is, is highly mediated, highly structured. Uh, it's after the fact, importantly, and perhaps it's not comprehensive. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is how we can get um, perhaps away from that kind of information and towards a more direct, unmediated and real-time information about violations of uh, fundamental rights. Uh, because of course, the, the, the nature of these uh, violations is that they're often hidden they're often difficult to detect. It's often difficult to get people to come forward. So what I want to talk about is uh, an experiment of Transparency International to try and encourage more people to come forward uh, and report these violations of, uh, of fundamental rights. I say an experiment. It's been going on for about 10 years now, uh, but it, it's still very much a work in progress. But uh, before, I, before I talk about that, uh, that experiment, I, I also just want to say a few things about the, the link between corruption and uh, 
and fundamental rights because I think it's not perhaps clear to a lot of people and I very much welcome the opportunity to uh, exchange with other colleagues in the human rights field on this issue. Um, uh, it, it should be clear I think that corruption uh, does break the link between law and practice, that it undermines, thereby undermines the rule of law and the trust in the rule of law uh, and importantly often prevents victims from exercising their fundamental rights. And it does this in a variety of, of, of direct and, and indirect ways. So directly, for example, it can, it can um, violate fundamental rights when the intention of the act is to restrict citizens' basic rights. For example, when you bribe a judge to uh, prevent, deny due process or a fair trial. Um, and uh, of course, corruption in the judiciary is a big problem in many of the member states uh, um, corruption can also indirectly violate uh, the very basic rights of EU citizens, for example, when local officials are bribed uh, to allow illegal dumping, which can then have an effect on the, um, uh, on the, on the health or other um, uh, rights of, of, of EU citizens. And of course, we have examples of that in, in member states as well. And of course, uh, uh, EU citizens also enjoy the right to good administration, uh, let's not forget, and that is violated when member states fail to adequately act against corruption, for example, when they fail to act against the embezzlement of, 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 of public funds. So uh, that, of course, is, is, is the theory, uh, but the question is, uh, how does this happen in practice, and to what extent, and how, how, how pervasive is it in uh, the EU? So w what I want to talk about now is, is uh, a way we have uh, tried to... Um, to document these violations through what we call uh, advocacy and legal advice centers, which we set up in, in, in countries all around the world. Uh, for short, we call them ALACs. I know that's a, a bit of a mouthful. It sounds like military hardware. It's not. It's actually much more powerful than that. Um, but uh, you can think of them as uh, whistleblower service centers, essentially. Um, and as I say, the, we have been uh, setting up these, these centers, these ALACs, for about, uh, for about 10 years now. The very basic idea with these centers is that they uh, provide uh, legal services to people who have been victims of corruption. Uh, they provide often legal representation for, for their cases. In some cases, uh, as a result of the complaints uh, that have been introduced, there is strategic litigation to try and uh, affect policy change in, the, in that particular area. There are also, to some extent, investigations as a result of the, uh, uh, the cases that are heard in these centers. Um, investigations are not necessarily uh, uh, police or judicial investigations. They may be desk investigations, uh, looking through, uh, searching registers, collecting information, uh, contacting authorities, things like that. Um, and also, and this is a, a, a burgeoning aspect of, of our work with these centers, is that they can also lead to uh, social sanctioning campaigns, particularly in those countries where there, the judicial system is not trusted, is corrupt, uh, where people don't feel that they have that kind of address. So, for example, we, we can have social sanctioning such as boycotts or, or naming and shaming exercises. Uh, and we also provide uh, information desks uh, where um, uh, citizens can learn more about their rights. Now, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, these uh, centers have been uh, a success. Uh, the very, with the very first, one of the very first ALACs that was set up in uh, Romania, uh, it received such a vast number of calls that it actually had to be shut down uh, and then had to be uh, uh, reinstituted a few weeks later um, and, and set up a new hotline. Um, and it's a success because I think it has shown that uh, citizens are not apathetic about corruption and about these violations. On the contrary, they really want to do something about this and there was a strong will to uh, get redress and to get something done. That, that is uh, why I think the, the, on the first evidence that these centers are a success. Uh, just a little bit about the numbers. Uh, we have um, uh, roughly uh, about 60 of these uh, ALACs uh, all around the world. Uh, in the EU, we run uh, ALACs in, in, in half of all the EU's member states. So that uh, includes countries in, in, in the southwest, in Bulgaria, in Romania, it includes countries in the northern part of the EU, in, in Ireland, for example, in France, uh, in the south, in Portugal, uh, uh, and also in, in the Baltic states and Latvia. So it covers the broad range of, of, of member states. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in total, uh, 140,000 citizens have come forward uh, to these ALACs uh, to report about corruption, to learn about their rights, 
uh, and to build uh, effective partnerships uh, a against corruption. Not all of those uh, numbers are, of course, in the EU, but uh, uh, it's, it's um, a large number of people who have been mobilized against uh, the violations of their rights. Um, so uh, this is something which I think uh, to address the title of this panel, which is to, to reflect on an uh, alert and a response system, could provide a, a, a real-time early warning system about uh, violations of, of, of uh, human rights and fundamental rights that perhaps we aren't aware of. Um, the gentleman from the Council of Europe said that all the evidence is there, but I think in many cases it is very difficult uh, to get the evidence or to get an accurate picture of what's happening, but perhaps through this uh, network of ALAX we can do that. Now, uh, and then the very last thought I will leave you with on this topic is that uh, we can only do that. I mean, we can do what we can as Transparency International to provide these people with uh, the comfort, in a sense, to provide them with the advice, to provide them with the, with the help that they need. But really, if we want people to come forward and report uh, violations of human rights in whatever field, we need very, very strong whistleblower protection legislation. And it very, it's very sad to say that even in a supposedly advanced jurisdiction like the EU, the protections, the legal protections for whistleblowers are very weak. In only four countries in the EU do we have an adequate legal system that protects whistleblowers. So that perhaps uh, may be the first place to start if we want to do something about uh, uh, an early warning and alert system for fundamental rights abuses. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm going to allow one burning question if there is one, unless everybody is completely satisfied, informed, convinced, tired. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just a, a, f a few concluding remarks. First of all, on a very personal note, I found this a, a very, very enriching two and a half hours. It seems like a lot more. Uh, we started out with the, uh, the ALDE initiative for the Democratic Governance Pact, and then uh, we, we actually, we, we, when we produced this, we were just having a lot of fun uh, as well. Um, but I'm actually beginning to get the feeling after this afternoon's panels that there is a lot of material out there to elaborate further, to start initiatives and to, you know, to not just complain about uh, the, the toolkit that doesn't work, but that the, the, the you know, we're only, I'm, I'm usually uh, just too impatient. I would like everything to work tomorrow, but I, I'm actually quite happy to see that something is beginning to, uh, to emerge here. Secondly, a thought that I had some time ago, but it came back to me listening to uh, Transparency International, that one of the things that Europe is lacking is, is not only, let's say, enforcement of fundamental rights, uh, but also uh, uh, what I would call the, the European Civil Liberties Union. Yeah. Uh, we have, there are emerging organizations, uh, for example, in the area of privacy and data protection, but something like uh, an umbrella organization which, which does advocacy, but also litigation, something which is, is you know, not really in our tradition, but extremely uh, helpful. Um, then uh, a final remark uh, about the, uh, the, the, the bingo uh, sheet. <laughs> I said uh, at the start that, um, you know, for this time it was going to be anonymous, that member states will not be um, identified. Uh, but I will, at the conclusion of this, uh, this seminar, uh, this, here's a giveaway. There are two countries that have green only. And uh, I think I will not shame them when I tell you uh, which ones they are, and they are Sweden and Denmark. Um, so this is a bit like the, the, Euro the Eurovision, Eurovision contest for uh, <laughs> fundamental rights. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but as we, we announced... We, we used to win that. You, you used to win. No, okay, well, here's the challenge, you see, because we're going to do this exercise again in fall. Uh, we're going to organize a new event, and who knows, it can be a cross-party uh, event. Um, and then, so all the countries are forewarned, because at the, the full event, we are going to publish the names, but they have until then to make sure that they're all green, okay? So that they're all good and on track. Well, that should be easy. Um, they have uh, more than half a year to go. So... Having said that, thank you all very much for being here. Thanks to the panelists, thanks to the audience, thanks to uh, the previous panelists and uh, 
I hope to see you again in full at the next uh, presentation of the scoreboard. Thank you.